In 1957, the free world enjoyed an unprecedented time of prosperity and satisfaction. America was proud and confident, seeing itself as a beacon of morality and advancement. But that self-righteous glow couldn't penetrate the Cold War chill of the Iron Curtain. The dividing line was formidable, but the people on the other side didn't seem threatening to most Americans. The U.S. was on the cutting edge of technology. The Soviets couldn't even keep their people fed. How could they take over the world? But American confidence would come to a screeching halt on October 4th. An aluminum sphere, two feet in diameter, had been launched into orbit around the Earth. It was Sputnik. The faint signal it beamed back to Earth blared loudly in the American consciousness. There was a space race being run, and the favorite was losing. To fully understand how the Soviets were able to secretly spring ahead, we need to go back to World War II. This is a story involving warring nations, political philosophies, and the intrigue of covert alliances. It is the story of how the Soviet Union and the United States started a race to conquer space and the real reasons behind it. anything it is the tale of dueling titans one a brilliant german scientist who built weapons for the nazis the other a shadowy russian genius whose space dreams sentenced him to years in a gulag concentration camp the first Werner von braun would become a renowned and respected scientist the acknowledged pioneer of america's space program the second Sergei Korolyov would remain hidden by the Soviet regime, his very existence classified as a state secret until after his death. Using rare archival footage from the former Soviet Union, we can now cast light into the dark corners of his career. Now we can explore the desperate race he ran with von Braun as each tried to conquer the stratosphere. This is the story of two great nations pitting singular genius against each other. A human drama of two strangers forced into battle by history and fate, but forever united in a legacy of space exploration. For decades, this unknown saga was locked away in the impenetrable vaults of Soviet history. Today, the seal is broken. Long hidden secrets are being liberated, and the amazing stories, once strictly classified under punishment of death, can now, for the first time, finally be told. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. With fascination, awe, and curiosity, humankind has always gazed skyward to a universe beyond our wildest imaginations, a place once thought to be beyond our reach. But maybe space travel wasn't the stuff of pure fantasy. In his famous novel, From the Earth to the Moon, written in 1865, Jules Verne pointed out that rocket thrust could work in the vacuum of space, and he correctly calculated the velocity needed to get there. The book was of great inspiration to Konstantin Solkovsky, an ingenious Russian school teacher who published detailed plans of rocket ships and space stations around the same time the Wright brothers were taking to the air. Gravity had been conquered. Maybe space would be next. American scientist Robert H. Goddard developed designs similar to those of Solkovsky and managed to put them into practice. By 1909, Goddard was testing rocket designs. Ten years later, he published a report that calculated the amount of fuel needed to send a projectile to the moon. 
But the American public wasn't ready for such far-flung ideas. The press labeled him a crackpot, and Goddard became the object of ridicule. The prescience of his ideas would never be truly appreciated until after his death. Though the Americans had derided Goddard's efforts, the rest of the world was fascinated by the prospect of rocket ships and trips to the moon. By the 1930s, the theoretical groundwork of Hermann Oberth in Germany and Friedrich Sander in Russia set the stage for space travel. But so far, space exploration was confined to the halls of academia and notebooks filled with complex calculations. It would take some brilliant engineering work to bring those concepts to the launch pad. Oberth and Sonder would find the help they needed. While Oberth put his faith in a young rocket scientist, Werner von Braun, Sonder would school a brilliant engineer named Sergei Korolyov. Each of these two young men would take the baton to realize the dreams of their teachers. Korolyov and von Braun were fascinated by flight from an early age. While youths, both were interested in gliders and for several years were active in competitions. This would soon grow into an interest in jet propulsion and from there, rocket development and space flight. Von Braun was soon working with the German Space Society. By the 1930s, Korolyov was actively involved in the work of a Moscow organization, the Group for Study of Jet Propulsion, known in Russia as GEARD. Both of these societies were heavily influenced by space enthusiasts, and desperately strapped for cash with which to conduct their ever more elaborate and expensive experiments. When the German military approached von Braun's space society, von Braun knew that only the military had a practical application for rockets and could fund their struggling group. So he made his deal with the Nazis, as he put it, to abuse rocket aviation. He became the technical director of the secret German rocket center, Pietermunde. There, the German war machine subsidized his dreams. Germany was not the first country to see the military applications of rockets. In 1932, as Soviet military interest grew, they formed a research center called Dreaktivny. Korolyov would serve as one of its chief engineers. Enormous public interest, the government's funding, and Korolyov's genius combined to shoot the Soviets into the early lead in the space race. Von Braun labored in relative obscurity for the Third Reich. Meanwhile, Korolyov worked in the security of a unit sponsored by the highest ranking officer in the Soviet army. Both men had every reason to believe that their positions were secure. But it is here that the tale of the world's two foremost rocket scientists would take a dramatic and nearly fatal turn. For both their fates were destined to veer away from greatness and toward a slow and painful death by the hand of the very regimes they served. In 1943, the tide of the war began to change. The once unstoppable Third Reich was now showing some vulnerability. Hitler suffered stunning defeats at Stalingrad and Kursk.
the Nazis turned to the research centers for some help in restoring their dissipating thunder. In July, Hitler was shown a film of von Braun's A-4 rocket. Believing it could be the super weapon the Nazis needed, Gestapo head Heinrich Himmler paid von Braun a visit. He wanted control of the rocket, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. Von Braun was arrested by the SS because Himmler was squeezing the army for control of the ballistic missile program. But what von Braun understood about Himmler and the other psychopaths uh, in the SS was that they really didn't understand much about rocketry, but they were killers. It was a very, very dangerous time. Von Braun's team returned to their rocket project, but their arrests and the climate it created helped delay its refinement. Eventually, von Braun's A-4 rocket was modified into a long-range liquid fuel missile called the V-2. Labor camp prisoners were put to work mass-producing the Nazis' latest weapon. In 1944, more than 1,000 of these V-2 rockets were sent to land in Britain. Nearly 3,000 people were killed. Another 6,500 were maimed and injured. Von Braun's space dreams had borne a nightmare of death. Von Braun's Russian counterpart, Korolyov, also suffered at the hand of his own government. Fueled by rumors and false information, Joseph Stalin grew suspicious of a conspiracy against his regime. He especially feared the power and influence of his highest ranking officer, General Tuhachevsky, who headed the Rocket Institute. Dryaktivny was purged, and Tuhachevsky was sentenced to death. The men that worked with him were either shot or sentenced to forced labor camps. Korolyov was shipped off to Siberia to serve an eight year sentence. Prisoners at the camp mined gold from the river by day and slept in ice-cold tents at night. Once a healthy athletic man, the 35-year-old grew exhausted and frail. Death, it seemed, was imminent. But fate interceded when well-known aviation designer Andrei Tupalyev requested his services. In 1939, though still technically a prisoner, Korolyov was moved to Shurashka, a design bureau and prison in Moscow, where the Tu-2 bomber was born. Korolyov would spend six years in prisons and camps, an innocent victim of Stalin's paranoia. Back in Germany, von Braun faced his own battles. As the Third Reich began to crumble, the SS issued last-minute orders to liquidate key scientists. Von Braun gathered his colleagues and offered to continue their work in rocket development for the United States. Once the Americans realized how advanced Germany's rocket program was and how desperately the Soviets were seeking out these same German scientists, a deal was struck. Von Braun and over 100 of his fellow scientists were brought to the United States as prisoners of war along with tons of V-2 documents and components for 100 V-2 rockets. The Soviets also yearned to know what secret weapons Hitler had. In 1945, a team of engineers, including Korolyov, was sent under heavy guard to Nordhausen, Germany's premier rocket base they hoped to uncover a treasure trove of information, but all they found was scraps. 
the Americans had gotten there first. They had destroyed everything they couldn't take from the base. The Soviets were left with only remnants. In the United States, the German scientists first worked on rocket development as prisoners of war, but were quickly and covertly integrated into regular civilian life. America's acquisition of the German scientists served to intensify the threat felt by the Soviets. Surrounded by the Allies' might, the Soviets responded by developing strategic and tactical missiles. Beginning in 1947, Korolyov conducted 11 launches of V-2 rockets assembled from parts found in Germany. But he would do more than just emulate the German program. We immediately decided that they had gotten Germans to do this for them. In reality, we got, as it says in the right stuff, this wonderful line, our Germans are better than their Germans, Senator, quoted to von Braun, and it really was true. Our Germans were better than their Germans. They got several thousand technicians uh, and a few engineers, but we really got the cream of the crop. What they did was they had geniuses like Kotelyov and many others, and they did it on their own. They took the few V2s they had and they worked them into super boosters. As a response to the American bombers in Europe, Korolyov created the R-5 missile, the first Soviet strategic missile with a nuclear warhead. Stalin's dream had been realized, but he would not be around to see the advancements Korolyov had in mind. Stalin died in 1953. During Nikita Khrushchev's subsequent struggle for absolute power, Korolyov's rocket program got immense support, and the genius didn't disappoint his country. By 1956, Korolyov had developed the giant R-7 missile, the first Soviet ICBM, affectionately known within Russia as Semyorka, old number seven. While those in power saw the rocket as a weapons platform, Korolyov hoped to use it to launch the first satellite into orbit. He wanted to explore. Others wanted to dominate. Khrushchev realized he could kill two birds with one stone. He could show off the missile's ferocious potential by letting Korolyov use it to launch an orbiting satellite. A marriage between politics and science was achieved. The Soviet space program was born. The October 4th, 1957 launch of Sputnik 1 began a long and impressive run of Soviet firsts. The hidden genius behind them all was Sergei Korolyov. When the Swedish Academy decided that the man responsible for Sputnik was worthy of the Nobel Prize, they asked the Soviet Academy for the name of its creator. Nikita Khrushchev responded, the creator is the Soviet people. Korolyov continued to remain in the shadows. Addressing cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin before the first manned space flight, the rare sight and sound of Korolyov was captured on film. I wish to congratulate you on the great honor bestowed on you in the name of our people, our beloved Communist Party to pilot the first flight to the space. I wish you a good flight and successful landing. May our spacecraft and our achievements reach higher and higher. I congratulate you and wish you good luck. Comrades, let me assure our government our Communist Party and the Soviet people that I will complete this mission with honor and will build the first road to space. And if I encounter any difficulties on this road, I will overcome them as good communists do. On April 12, 1961, Vostok 1 carried Yuri Gagarin on a single orbit of the Earth making him the first man in space. He returned home to a hero's welcome. 
one man was conspicuously absent from the parades, Korolyov. So great was his value to the Soviets, they decided that he must remain a secret, hidden from the world and from his own public. While his counterpart, von Braun, overcame the stigma and condemnation of his Nazi ties and was openly lauded for his vast contributions to America's space program, Korolyov toiled under the heavy veil of secrecy, first as a prisoner in his own country, later as a closely guarded state secret. Korolyov was not allowed to publish articles under his own name, travel abroad, or correspond with foreign space experts. His labors were recognized only as the labors of the Soviet people. And still, he continued to make astounding leaps. He designed the Soviet lunar and space lab programs and was also responsible for Soviet rocket launches to Mars and Venus. I want to live at the foot of all the solar system's planets, he once said. All of the great people have their personalities and uh, these personalities are very strong. So when we talk about the Karalov, it's more to compare him with the great general. He could pick the right people. He could pick right ideas, put everybody together. These people were day and night. They were so enthusiastic. Then I think he was genius because when he was replaced with other people, everything fell apart. It did not work. Sergei Korolyov died on the operating table when he was 59 years old in January 1966. A few days before, he told his doctor he needed another 10 years to accomplish all that he had planned. While a closely guarded secret in life, with his death, Korolyov was granted official recognition. Yuri Gagarin later said that at the funeral, he wanted to express his deep feelings, but he wasn't permitted to. Today, we can embrace the memory of the man who raised mankind to new heights. With new disclosures about Sergei Korolyov's amazing life and legacy, the world can finally recognize the amazing contributions he made to the exploration of space. Korolyov's is not the only life hidden in the murkiness of a carefully manipulated historical record. In a society where there were no state failures or crime or natural disasters, truth was an elusive commodity. In 1963, the Soviet Union boasted the first woman cosmonaut in space. But not far beneath the glowing accounts lurks a tale of disappointment, injustice, and lies. Finally, the story of Russia's women cosmonauts can be told. Revealed after so many years of obscurity, theirs are among the most stirring tales in the annals of space history. In the 1960s, the space race served as a metaphor at the center of an ideological battle between the world's two superpowers. Of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The seesawing contest to dominate space was much more about politics than it was about the pursuit of science. Dreams were often sacrificed in the name of publicity. After the stunning flight of Yuri Gagarin, Khrushchev began planning the next space spectacular. It wouldn't do to merely go longer in space. He needed something sensational, a splashy display of prowess to reassert Soviet supremacy. The answer would be to launch the world's first woman in space. But what kind of woman? There were highly qualified female doctors and engineers in the space program, but they were passed over. 
This woman must be an ordinary Russian girl, a worker from a common background. Her flight would demonstrate to the world that under the great socialist system of equality, one need only be a good citizen to go into space. A committee began screening women from a pool who had written into the space program. The candidates were interviewed, their backgrounds investigated, and their physical abilities tested. One of the five women ultimately selected, Valentina Panamanova, recognized the female cosmonauts' importance to the nation. We were a part of the system, a part of its ideology. We had no doubts that the first woman in space would be a Soviet woman. With only a year and a half before the mission, the preparations were arduous. Nicknamed seagulls, the women endured months of classroom lectures, rigorous exercise, and jet training. Somebody suggested that it should be given the call sign Eagle. And somebody in the Russian space program said, an eagle is a great bird. It's a predator, i.e., you can't call a woman uh, eagle. So somebody said, uh, how about call sign seagull? They eat fish. And everybody broke up. They roared. When the time came to select the woman who would go into space, no one was surprised. She was 24-year-old Valentina Tereshkova a textile worker from a farming family. With her experience as a parachutist and strong communist ideology, she seemed the perfect choice, not just for the flight, but for the public role she would take on afterwards. It was Tereshkova who was chosen, of workers and peasants' origin, all this stuff. But in my opinion, she was also the only woman who passed all the medical checkups without a hitch. Regardless of the criteria that went into her selection, the pressure on Tereshkova was enormous. She would become the first woman in space, June 16, 1963. I've begun my duties. All of the systems are working perfectly. I feel excellent. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was sure to milk the pioneering flight for all it's worth. Hear you loud and clear, Seagull. Let me just call you Valya, Valentina. I'm very happy and proud as a father that our girl, a Soviet girl, is the first one for the first time in space. And we are so proud of your successes, of you. When you are admired so much by your people, our motherland, our party, our idea. For Khrushchev and the Soviet Union, the pride was immense. But for Tereshkova, it was the beginning of an ordeal comprised of cover-ups and lies. She had become nauseated and threw up in the capsule. Space sickness is common, but Tereshkova knew that it had kept a previous cosmonaut from flying again. She said nothing about it, nor did she eat anything during her three-day flight. When she returned, she quickly concealed what she had done. Boris Novikov was a member of the medical support team for Tereshkova's flight. She threw all of the space food to the local people to conceal the fact that she hadn't eaten anything in space. Tereshkova was lauded as a heroine, but like the system that created her, she wasn't always truthful. A member of the flight team, Alexander Korsakov. She told a lot of lies, incomplete information. During her flight, physicians told her, turn her head this way, now that way. She said, Roger, I did it, but she didn't. The experiment failed. Another untold story involved the condition in which technicians found the spacecraft after Tereshkova landed. When the landing craft returned, the inner glass plate of the window was cracked. This was a serious failure because if the glass broke, she would die. 
We tried to figure out how it happened. Heat, poor design, we couldn't figure it out. What they ultimately discovered was that Tereshkova knew more than she had let on. Eventually, we learned that she cracked the window with the camera. It was a critical question of spacecraft design, and the cosmonaut concealed the truth. She so wanted to be liked. We can't know what motivated the cosmonaut to lie. She seemed to know that her primary responsibility was to maintain appearances above all else. But there may have been another reason. The women cosmonauts didn't want their program to be terminated. They were already in a tenuous position. Their program was solely designed to place the first woman into space. Would they now be integrated into the cosmonaut program? Despite all the propaganda about the equality of Soviet citizens, there were built-in hypocrisies. Ideals aside, the society was dominated and controlled by a few powerful men, as it had been for centuries past. These men had created the image of the hero cosmonaut, and women didn't seem to fit the mold. I don't think this heroic myth would be shattered if women flew. But subconsciously, some men may feel that way. The male cosmonauts we knew always objected to women flights. Always. But why? Try to ask them. Many cosmonauts, like Alexander Serebrov, had strong opinions. I am against equality between men and women. Why do you want to do a man's heavy work? Why? The female cosmonauts remained in training but they were not assigned flights. Khrushchev got what he wanted, a symbolic spokeswoman for Soviet equality. The other women were banished to obscurity. Several times we were assigned to different new programs. The lunar program, for example. Not only I, but all of us. But when the idea of a woman flying emerged, the military said, no, we don't need it. We have men and they fly, get lost. The first group of female cosmonauts had been selected for ideological purity and class origin, with their ceremonial duties seen as more important than their time in space. Their medical, physical, and psychological standards were comparable to their male counterparts, but they were selected precisely because they lacked the elitist pilot skills that were foremost in the selection of the men. Their ultimate failure to achieve a second female piloted flight was based on the internal view that they were really only on the program as propaganda tools. It would be 20 years before another woman would have the chance to prove that they were equal in space. In 1980, a second class of female cosmonauts was selected with very different criteria. These three women were the elite of the Soviet pilot forces. They were determined to prove themselves in space. This time, Cosmonauts like Svetlana Savitskaya believed they would be judged only on the basis of their abilities. If after you've flown, they start to think that it would be better if women didn't fly, it is probably the result of your performance. I understood that very clearly. Credentials aside, their inclusion in the space program had propagandist motives as well. To upstage the pending female astronaut flights on the space shuttle. For cosmonaut Natalia Kuleshova, propaganda and progress weren't mutually exclusive. During the formation of the second women's group, there was some looking at what the Americans were doing, because they also began to move. They formed a women's group and that helped us. We had everything to gain. Why should we allow the second woman in space to be American? The Soyuz T-7 launched in August 1982. The second woman in space, cosmonaut Savitskaya, performed flawlessly.
The other women saw Savitskaya's success as a precedent. У меня было прекрасное настроение, потому что я знал, что я отработал свой первый этап очень хорошо. I was in very good spirits because I knew that I had done very well on my first assignment, and the next flight would be mine. It was already scheduled. But it was not to be, as was the case with the first group of women. They began to realize that there was little room for them in the space program. Even Savitskaya, with a successful mission under her belt, was dispensable. She was unceremoniously dismissed as Peronina's backup. A couple of months passed while we trained and they trained. Then I was on a business trip. On my return, they told me, well, you are rejected. Savitskaya had been replaced by a man. Shortly thereafter, Peronina would also lose her place in the next mission. I couldn't believe that they would undermine the women's program like that. Then they found some reason to terminate her training, too. They wouldn't tell her the truth. They said that the flight program was cancelled. It was too late and no other woman was available. So a man's crew flew. It was all quite deliberate. Ilyana Dabrikvashina remembers the beginning of the end. And then the day came when Kosmonaut Leonov summoned us and said, Well, girls, you don't have prospects anymore. We can no longer afford women's flights. So it would be better if you return to your main jobs. Despite their effort, determination and skill, the Soviet women would fail in their efforts to integrate the cosmonaut program. Not once, but twice. The tenet of gender equality, so ostentatiously paraded by the Soviets, was mere myth. In reality, the female cosmonauts were nothing more than pawns in a giant propaganda game. While they fed public opinion with embroidered narratives of the women's success, the Soviets buried the real story. The untold accounts of injustice and unfulfilled dreams were, until now, hidden away in the vast Soviet archive. Theirs is just one of many programs misrepresented by history. But some stories, buried deeper, were so highly classified, it is as though they never existed at all. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union and the United States engaged in a very public battle to be the first to send a man to the moon. Yet after the landing of Apollo 11, the Soviets refused to acknowledge this race. Rather than finish second, they would dismantle their manned moon program and claim it never existed. The Soviets told the world they were much more interested in establishing manned space stations. Many in the United States were willing to accept this as proof that the Soviet space program was not as advanced as some had claimed. This is the true story of that non-existent program. A story of political competition, management debacles, and wasted resources. Like the lost dreams of Khrushchev's communism, the Soviet manned moon project failed to meet its extraordinary expectations. With an early lead in the space race, the Soviets made the fatal error of ignoring a key tenet of American capitalism. They underestimated the competition. It would cost them dearly. In order to win more converts on the global stage, Khrushchev forced his designers to waste valuable time and resources on propaganda The Vashod flights permitted a number of Soviet firsts. The first pair, the first walk, 
and the first trio of cosmonauts in space. But they accomplished little technological advancement in the race to the moon. In the meantime, America was hustling to build its space infrastructure. The U.S. had wisely consolidated its efforts with the formation of NASA. Now there was just one American space program, and it was working towards a single goal, placing a man on the moon before 1970. In the Soviet Union, the opposite was occurring. Success had created a number of different design bureaus, which now competed for resources and projects, the bulk of which were dedicated to military operations. And whatever the spin, building military missiles was much more important to the government than landing a human on the moon. But not everyone shared those priorities. Shortly after the Sputnik launch, Soviet chief designer Korolyov submitted a proposal for a lunar landing program. He began by aggressively sending probes to the moon in 1959. The plans for the N-1 booster, necessary to send men to the moon, went into design before Kennedy even announced the Apollo program. Korolyov knew they must beat the Americans. But there were early difficulties. It took more than 30 first stage engines to give the N-1 its tremendous thrust. The synchronization of these engines was critical. There was only one engine designer considered up to the task. Chief designer Valentin Glushko. But Glushko had feuded with Korolyov and teamed up with Korolyov's arch rival, Chilami. So the Soviets split their manned moon project into two separate programs. Chilami's group was designing a lunar orbiting mission using the predecessor to the Proton rocket, the UR-500. Korolyov's group was designing a lunar landing mission using the N-1 booster. The Soviets' great strength was now a liability. Their brilliant designers were now engaged in jealousy and politics, competing for limited resources. In the Soviet Union, you had competing people called chief designers uh, who were chief designers of particular systems, chief designer of the rocket engine, of the spacecraft, etc. But they often did not see eye to eye. There wasn't a single uh, management mechanism that molded all their views into a seamless uh, process. So you had a lot of dissension, discord in how to design the rocket. It was soon evident that the Lunar Orbiting Group, led by Chilomi, would be unable to beat the Americans, even though it would be more than three years before Apollo 8 would successfully carry three American astronauts around the moon. The Soviets already knew their efforts were doomed. Development of the UR-500 continued for military applications, but lunar orbit work ended. For the Soviets, being second meant being a failure. They would now concentrate on the main objective, the moon landing. By now, the Americans were using their Gemini program to practice the skills needed for a lunar landing mission. The Soviets knew they were in a race. Still, they had their top secret genius, Korolyov. The Communist Party's Central Committee selected him to put together a comprehensive plan for reaching the moon. Korolyov was now poised to consolidate the Soviets' efforts, combining his in one booster with a manned, zoned capsule. Then, fate dealt an unexpected card. In January 1966, the chief designer fell victim to an inept surgeon's knife. After his death, there was no one within the Soviet space program capable of pulling the feuding factions together for another Soviet glory. Korolyov's death would foreshadow the end of the race to the moon. Despite this setback, the Soviets would continue their efforts. The first test launch of the N-1 booster occurred in February 1969.
This rare footage shows that little known event. It ended 70 seconds into its flight. By the time of the second test, the only chance the Soviets had to beat the Americans was for Apollo to be delayed. As it turned out, even that wouldn't have helped. On June 3, 1969, four tenths of a second into the flight, a misfired engine doomed this mission. What you are seeing are the extremely rare images of that catastrophe. crashed onto the launching pad and completely destroyed it. As you can see, the rocket is huge. It uh, contains almost 3,000 tons of propellant. That's why explosion was awful. It completely destroyed the launch pad. Uh, that was a major setback in the Soviet lunar program. And uh, despite the fact that uh, it continued, it certainly was far behind the schedule. <laughs> More launches were attempted, but both failed. With the United States already on the moon, the Soviet program abruptly ceased. Two ready-to-fly boosters were destroyed in 1976. The program was abandoned and erased from the history of the Soviet nation, lost to time. Until now. We do not know what other stories lay locked in the vaults of Soviet space history. Given their ability to erase the past, it's possible that the Soviets have successfully concealed more embarrassing, bizarre, or horrifying stories than the world will ever know. But with each new disclosure, we learn more about the crucible of the Cold War, how the pressure to win the space race forged fact into fiction and fiction into history. And as each untold story is revealed, unknown faces, personalities, frustrations, challenges, and accomplishments are exposed. Their sagas fill in so many unanswered questions, infusing the memory of the space race with the richness, veracity, and inspiration that history demands and that these pioneers deserve. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit jiu.edu to find out more.